Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I would like to wish all of you a very, very happy new year and welcome you back to our conversations on the inclusive innovation economy. Uh, I'm delighted today that we're really going to be talking about uncovering capital and finding new funding models uh, for BIPOC entrepreneurs. Uh, as always with these conversations, it's a real pleasure just to be exploring new topics, uh, returning to topics that we know are extremely important, and really being able to listen and understand uh, what our community of diverse innovators and entrepreneurs actually need to support them uh, in building this inclusive innovation economy. Uh, my name is Fiona Murray. I'm the Associate Dean for Innovation and Inclusion at MIT Sloan. Uh, I'm joined in that work by my colleague, Professor Ray Reagans. Uh, but as important and most important, I'm joined in these conversations and in our action-oriented work at Sloan uh, by my friend and colleague, Malia Lazu. Uh, these conversations are meant to be action-oriented. They're meant to be about how we build an inclusive innovation economy, the kind of economy we want. Uh, for ourselves, for those around us, for our communities. How we do that in Boston, how we do that across different places and cities in the United States, and how we do that uh, around the world. We've already had the opportunity to talk to some extraordinary entrepreneurs, to talk to business leaders, to talk to those from the traditional uh, banking sector about what part they have to play, about how they can change the way they do things, how they can be allies, how they can support, and how we can really change uh, the system and the ecosystem in which we operate to be inclusive and to make sure that everybody has access to the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of capital and resources that they absolutely need. Uh, as we begin this live conversation, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. This Each conversation is an opportunity to deep dive into different ways of thinking about inclusion in the innovation economy, and it's intended to be action oriented. Uh, ideas plus actions. Ideas without actions are not enough. Uh, actions not grounded in ideas and facts and inspiration uh, will just leave us where we are today. So it's those two things taken together. This is also about building a community and a conversation of inclusive, innovative leaders. Um, and I especially want to note we absolutely welcome the voice of alumni, of staff, of students and faculty. And that in and of itself is, is special and I think important. And I also want to give a special shout out to um, the OER team who do a tremendous job in uh, organizing this and, and, and keeping us um, on the straight and narrow and making sure that we can make these things available. And I'd also commend you to have a look at all the amazing writing uh, that our comms team have done. They follow up every one of these conversations with really insightful articles that pick out some of the highlights of a conversation and make us all uh, make, make sure that we are smarter because we're uh, working together is really an important piece of this. So we absolutely welcome your input and your ideas, your contributions, your questions. Um, we're also looking for your suggestions about who else you'd like to hear from uh, and your interviews as part of our cultural economy project. And so with that, I am going to kick things over to Malia. Malia, over to you. Thank you, Fiona, and hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you in the new year. And if there's ever been a time for a community and for us getting together with ideas and actions, it is 2021. For this talk, we really wanted to make sure that we were highlighting people on the cutting edge of finance and investment. So often we hear about traditional financing and how it excludes people of color, women. In previous talks, we've heard from entrepreneurs who have been a part of that exclusion and navigated beyond it. And we also heard from traditional financiers who are trying to be better in their work. But today, we're going to be hearing from two women who are doing things completely differently. These are women who are building new models to support entrepreneurs and businesses of color. Joining us live is Lynn Huey, Managing Director of Omina Fund at, at Candide Group. And she's a financial activist that is laser focused on helping deep impact funds and social enterprise realize their potential to address system failures with a social justice lens. In her previous role at RSF, Lynn employed an integrated capital approach, coordinating diverse financing tools with network connections and advisory support to fuel enterprises that are solving complex social problems. Lynn is passionate about racial and gender equity. 
and she puts access to women entrepreneurs, particularly of women, women of color at the center of her work, acknowledging that these groups are vastly underserved by mainstream funders. She was instrumental in deploying nearly $2 million to these entrepreneurs. Lynn is an integrated capital fellow at Chartered Accountant and has an MBA in corporate finance from the Madrid-based IE Business School. And joining us in a pre-recorded video is Conda Mason. Conda is a social entrepreneur and, um, and social justice activist. She is also co-founder of Jubilee Partners and president of Jubilee Justice, a nonprofit working to bring economic equity to BIPOC farmers and ecological sustainability yeah. while convening deeply transformational journeys, exploring the intersection of land, race, money, and spirit. She is the co-founder and founding CEO of Impact Hub Oakland, and she is the strategic director of the Runway Project, a micro lending funding for African-American entrepreneurs intended to close the friends and family gap funding that we see here in the US. Conda is also an accomplished filmmaker and artist manager and the recipient of an Academy Award nomination and a Grammy Award winner. Um, Conda is also a certified yoga teacher and a mindfulness meditation teacher. So it's wonderful to have input from these two amazing, really pioneers and in, um, in, in this field. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Malia. So we're going to start with you and a question for you, which is when we talk about these new models and these creative models of capital, what, what exactly are we talking about? Could you give us a little color on, on what, um, what this is and what it looks like and, and why it's there? Yeah, happy to. So I think in order to really talk about the new models that exist, there's a really critical part that we have to do and examine why the existing models are here in the first place. So to understand that the existing models of financing and venture capital and other capital resources have been built up on exclusionary um, from, from excluding people. And they've been built up on policies and systemic issues within our financial system that have led to a number of individuals being completely excluded from even participating in those models. So it's really important to start from that frame because as this, you know, we're talking about inclusion right now. So part of what it is, is also understanding that the models have been created so that returns accrue primarily to the capital holder. They don't accrue to community. And that is very intentional in order to keep like certain structures in place within how in our capitalist society. So if we look at those models and are like, okay, these models have worked for a very specific percentage of the population, predominantly white men. And we actually want to build an economy and we want to build models that are inclusive for all, then it really starts at like the governance structure like, for example, at Olamina, the way we set up the fund is that the com we have a community advisory board that participates in the decision making of all credit and lending decisions, which is kind of, and each of those people represent the communities that we serve. And that's pretty innovative because usually you put, you put your loan application into a bank and it disappears, right? And then you find out yes or no. So it's like really starting from the, at all levels, from the governance structure, from, um, who, what does a return mean for justice? So like if you are a high net worth individual and you have made your money and had your market-based returns, like how do you set up structures within a fund to ensure that money is, you know, lent out to people who have intentionally been excluded from participating in the system and maybe you don't need your market-based return and maybe we just name that. Um, and so it's really like building it from the ground, these models from the ground up of understanding what isn't working and what we don't want to do, and then getting feedback, ensuring that we're always centering community in the decision making decision making processes around who gets money and why. Yes, yes. And I'm so appreciative about starting with the why because Conda um, is joining us in this pre-recorded video and 
we asked her about her work that she's doing down south and supporting BIPOC farmers. And she also started with the Y. So we're going to hear from her now. The videos of, of, of what's happening to people, we, we, we can shoot them on our phones now, but nobody's got their cell phones out here where I am in Louisiana looking at what is happening to to the farmers here. And so I'm here to do the work to try to um, to help on that level and to plug the holes. So I'm working, I have a new nonprofit called Jubilee Justice. Um, and you can you know go to the website and see um, what that is. We are working with farmers, with black farmers, um, with a very sustainable way of growing rice that is also good for the planet. It's good for the farmers and it will maximize the little plots of land that they have as well as we've started a fund called Hot Liquor Capital that is actually surrounding the farmers with the kind of the kind of capital that they need, what we're calling reparative capital, um, which is a integrated capital model that involves both um, grants um, and uh, recoverable grants and very low interest loans. And so that's what we're doing is surrounding them by this capital and this way of growing rice and other crops that maximizes tiny spaces because we have smaller acreage than white uh, farmers do. And, and I'm out here working in Louisiana. I'm in uh, the Mississippi Delta, working with farmers in the Mississippi as well as in South Carolina. And um, yeah, and I'm meeting such beautiful, amazing people. Um, and and they really bearing well. witness to a problem that yeah. we, as you said, we're, that, that's invisible to, to so many of us. And that's mm -hmm. this loss and, and this loss of land. Yeah. Yeah. The loss of land is, un, is incredible. It's really unbelievable. And I mean, here in Louisiana, there were hundreds and hundreds of sugarcane, black sugarcane farmers. This is the land of sugarcane. There are four now. And one of them. I'm working, we've been working hard to try to save him, a 70-year-old man, that they're trying to take his farm and take his, his home. I mean, it is devastating what is happening here. So we hear about this, you know, this devastation in the South around ownership and, and land ownership, which as we know, ownership is how Americans acquire wealth. Um, and, you know, we've gone from 30 thousand, I think she said, um, you know, or black farmers are losing 30,000 acres, but they've gone from hundreds of sugarcane farmers to four sugarcane farmers. Um, so we're, it seems like even at a time where we're talking about this, we're losing ground to the culture of traditional banking. And Lynn, I know that you come out of a more traditional um, banking and, and business approach. And I would love for you to help us understand um, how what you're doing can, and you know what what this field is doing can help either influence traditional capital or um, you know or make it irrelevant um, for people of color who need to who need to raise capital. Yeah, thanks, Malia. You know, it's it's interesting. Like a lot of the times in the work that we do, we talk about who um, is in the system and who is outside of the system. So who is in the system, like trying to make it better and who is outside of the system creating the new so that when we move over to the new, it's already set up for us, right? So, you know, I'm a little bit of a cynic. I don't know how much banking can actually be reformed. One thing I would note, just as an aside, um, Olamina really focuses on lending money to community development and financial institutions that are 501c3s, that are, are place-based, that came out of the civil rights movement. And so, like, I actually think our traditional banking system can be influenced by the people who have money and are investing in it. If we look at even just what's happened with the upright, um, with the insurrection, banks came out and said, well, we're no longer going to donate money to certain political parties that have participated in this. And like, this is what people's money is doing when you have a bank account there, when you are investing um, with them, right? And they come out and say that they're going to stop doing this. And if we think about what it took for them to say that they are going to stop doing that, it's, it seems to me to be a marketing ploy. Whereas if you invest locally and in community with community development financial institutions or local funds based in Boston, like Kijima Project, 
these um that's not an issue because they can't give political donations like they are rooted in community and are constantly working with grassroots organizers to get what's needed so there's a large influence that has to come from the shareholders and the owners of the banks in order for them to shift and then the final thing i'll say on that is oftentimes what banks do is they have their foundation that does work around you know granting money to entrepreneurs of color but the bank on the credit side hasn't changed how they are looking at these businesses fundamentally. So as Malia, I know you and I have talked about it and you've written about it, you end up keeping people kind of in this philanthropic charitable mentality and to actually break down the silos between what the bank and traditional finance is doing and its foundation to work together on this integrated capital approach that we keep talking about. If the banks could do that, then it would be transformational, but it has to come both from like what the entrepreneurs are saying they need and then what the, um, what the shareholders are saying that they want and hold these institutions accountable to doing better. Can I, can I just jump in with it? I mean, I think then you make this incredibly important point that is true in banks. I think it's also true in quite a lot of other organizations and it's true in large corporations, right? That you have the sort of set of corporate goals over here and then some related foundation oriented activities over here um, or the sort of corporate social responsibility budget. And they actually treat the same self same individuals really, really differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one flavor of entrepreneurs goes one side and, and then, you know, entrepreneurs who are often from underrepresented communities kind of get shunted over into the sort of social responsibility flavor. Or we see that in some foundations, right? The way in which the endowment is managed seems completely antithetical to the actual goals of the foundation. And right. it, so it feels as if this word that you've used about integration mm -hmm. um, is actually a, a key piece here. It, it's about sort of being locally engaged in the community but doing it in a way that is integrative and has a, a sort of a logic that accumulates as opposed to sort of being this odd trade-off and, and so I really I just want to underscore that because for me that's a really important idea that you you put out there. And Lynn I would love if you could actually put some color on that because mm -hmm. the way you do <clears throat> I mean, I'm familiar with, with how you leverage your capital, but one of the things that I was very, that Lynn and I talked a lot about when I was at a bank at the bank was how can her capital help de-risk me, right? So if, if the minute you start talking about lending to BIPOC, even though there is no data that shows that people of color Pay, you know, pay back at less rates than, than white people do. Um, but all of that goes in and all of a sudden it seems like this is a risky deal. And mm -hmm. what you do in these integrated capital, um, you know, efforts is really try to help mitigate risk. And I would love for you to talk a little bit about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, happy to. So um, what are the, what do we think about when we're lending money, whether it's through, Olamina Fund or through another um, organization I work with called the Katali Foundation is um, we can de-risk um, certain, certain financial risks by having a subordinated debt layer. So what we acknowledge, and I'll use, I'm going to put my um, foundation hat on right now, is we basically recognize that in order to leverage um, and influence like traditional capital, they need to be brought to the table. And oftentimes because of the racialized policies in banking that have never really truly been corrected or addressed, like redlining still happens. I've actually seen it in credit committee with my own eyes. So how do we bring people to the table to like give them, okay, we can de-risk your loan. We will subordinate our position and that will bring more folk in, but then also challenge them on the conversation of, well, if we're de-risking your loan, then maybe you should reconsider your interest rate or reconsider your terms. Or like, let's talk about how your, your credit policy could be amended to actually reflect the fact that organizations who are led by people of color actually perform better. I heard a crazy, um, what I thought was like a, an amazing statistic about California indigenous communities during the recession, they actually, indigenous communities have a, the, one of the highest percentages of entrepreneurship. Like it exceeds the um, US national average. And during the recession, 
those businesses on the rever reservation perform better than Main Street. So it's also about like the people who have access to this knowledge, once they have the um, traditional financers at the table, it's also engaging them in, in conversations and education around how we see them trying to do better, but some of their practices are still harmful. And here's how we think that they could, you know, move along a bit. Thank you. We also asked Conda about traditional banking and, and how banks have to look at this differently. And, and she had some thoughts as well. You know, the traditional ways have not, ha have not worked clearly. We, we wouldn't have the gaps that we have. Um, what they do is actually the traditional ways of financing. Uh, well, the, the whole financial system, as far as I'm concerned, is just broken. And it has created a broken world, right? When we look at the planet, when we look at everything that's happening, it's, it's underneath it, you follow the money and it's finance. And so the financial system is broken and it's creating a world that's broken. And so we have to, we have to, if we're going to, I think, you know, um, continue to be human beings on a planet, the planet will be fine if we all left, you know, she'll get herself together and, 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 you know, compost all of us. But um, and, until such time, you know, if we really want to be here, we're going to have to change the way we do things and the way we live on, on, on it and how we treat each other. Because how we treat each other is endemic on how we treat the planet. It's the same mindset. And so when I think about it, I, it's, it goes deeper than tactical ways of doing, like, you know, let's change this tactical thing that we do. No, we need to change deeper than that, honestly. I mean, if you really want to know my opinion, it's the, it's the mindset that has created the problem that has to be changed in order to make any kind of real transformation of any system. The mindset that created the system is how you're going to change that system. Okay, so it begins to me with the mindset of this capitalist and what we call racial capitalism. Racial capitalism, is, capitalism in this country has ba been based on, as we know, the backs of um, the, 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 the theft of land of, from indigenous people, the, um, the theft of land from, from black people, um, from free labor and from extinguishing, you know, the indigenous people on, that were here. So the entire capitalist system was based on extraction and extracting on every level. And what we need to do in order for it to change is that we have to change the mindset of extraction to the mindset of regeneration. Mm -hmm. The mindset of regeneration. I mean, I think if that's not the word for 2021, that should just be all of our all of our themes. That this idea of of regeneration. Um, you know, I want to jump in um, to a question from uh, another question from the audience, um, and this one basically says, you know, th this world works for white guys. They they got it on lock why would they, you know, what, what would motivate them to, to change um, this and, you know, to, to change them being on top? And, and in my inclusion work, I often talk to, you know, the white community and remind them that when you're privileged, equity is a step down. And so mm -hmm. it's going to feel that way <laughs> right? because you're privileged and now you're going to live like the rest of us. And that's going to be, that's going to suck for you. So, you know, what do you see around the, um, you know, around white men with money getting it or, or them being motivated to, to do it differently? Um, is it, uh, you know, do we have to meet at a tennis court um, in France? Um, <laughs> how do we, how do we get there? Um, that is such a, big huge question and as somebody who had who kind of started getting there and I'm obviously not a white man I'm a white woman a woman but you know I had to have this own moment and coming to my realization but oftentimes like it's just exposure to people who aren't the same as you and I had been exposed to a group of um amazing black 
women, people of color at a fellowship and was able to have conversations about the impact that the financial system was actually having. And so oftentimes, like, I don't, I think the change actually happens at a very deep personal level that then goes to like a corporate level that then goes to a policy level. And I don't think it's some, like we could change a bunch of policies with the new administration and absolutely have to change a bunch of them, particularly around voter suppression and everything we thought that was codified that isn't. But like, I think the incentives come from like knowing folk and having the experience and putting yourself out there. And then that's, it also comes from like really listening to people within your own organizations about what's happening to them and being held accountable and be willing to do that. I mean, I think so often now that I'm going to get a little woo woo here, I think so often we are separated by how we define ourselves, whether it's through race, gender, ethnicity, class, but at the end of the day, we're all human. And when we put that all together, that we're all humans who just want the same basic things, it makes change and transformation possible. Um, so that's on like my human level. On a very practical level, they have to have their money challenged. <laughs> like, you know, the shareholder piece, like being held accountable, like, and shareholder activism or having investors my, like myself, like really influence that and like, you know, really push on what we want to see change and happen, but we have to do it from a place of empathy and compassion. Otherwise, if you bring people to the table unwillingly, it won't last. That's right. That's right. And, you know, you, you said um, you started with something very similar to what Martin Luther King told Harry Belafonte when he had to go in and meet JFK who was president and who called to meet with Harry, you know, cause he was the famous one of the civil rights movement. And Harry asked Martin, what am I going to say? You know, this guy is a northerner. He's, you know, his father was a bootlegger. You know, the civil rights crew was not looking at JFK as an ally. Um, and Martin Luther King said to Harry, go in and find his moral center and win him to our cause. And there's something around our interconnectedness um, that hopefully, you know, we can find um, find their moral centers and, and have them understand. And I also want to reinforce what you said, which is the future is this, right? The, the future is black and brown, the most educated demographic in America are black women. So it's soon going to be hard to do business um, without doing business with, with people of color. And that gets to um, a question around, do you think these models become mainstream or, or do you think there's a sort of shadow financial industry that might be separate and unequal? <laughs> I mean, there's the like what I want and what I hope, right? So part of me um, hopes that it goes mainstream, but only if it goes mainstream under a different set of parameters. So if we just like, in, I work in impact investing. I'm sure y'all have heard that term. Like impact investing's like biggest marketing phrase was like do well by doing good. And we basically recreated the existing financial system within impact investing, but felt a little good because we had some social, social goals that were being met. And I think that's something that these new models have to be very mindful of, of like actually recreating the system that we are saying we don't want to see. So there's part of me that hopes until we are really have built all the infrastructure and laid all of the groundwork and gotten back to like what it means to invest in community, it does stay kind of shadowed. And then when we're ready and we are, you know, really grounded, then it becomes more mainstream. You know, um, I have a, I had a conversation with someone, both Millie and Conda know, Jessica Norwood, who runs a runway project. And I think there was a question about seed money. Um, and I would absolutely look up the runway project if you need friends and family capital. But Jessica made a really good point, which is like, the grief and trauma within this system impact us all, but if we don't actually address it, we are just going to build these new models within that grief and within that trauma. And, you know, the financial system doesn't just harm people of color. It also harms people who look like me. White supremacy harms people who look like me too. So I think like really it's, it comes back to like the foundations of the why, you know, and I don't necessarily want to see these new models 
recreate the existing system as what happened with impact investing. There has to be a third way. Right, right. And and we we so fall into to the trap of recreating um, you know, the the capitalist models that that got us here um because the pull is so strong, right? I mean, when when you said um, I, I think you said something about maybe you don't need to, you know, make all the profits or, I mean, that's blasphemy, right? I mean, that, that, that's, you're going, you're going against the church of, of American capitalism by, by saying something like that. And that pull is so natural. Um, we do have another question from the audience that I want to pull in here as we're talking about, you know, who's included and who's not. And that's really people with disabilities. And we know that folks with disabilities are the most invisible. We also know that 50% of the black people killed by cops were, were people with, um, you know, with, with disabilities. So could you talk about any, anything that you might know of um, that, that supports and, and funds the people with disabilities? Yeah, so I know that there are a couple of CDFIs. Um, there's one on Long Island that I'll get the name of, right? I'll get the name of and I can send it afterwards. It is specifically focused on lending money to people with uh, um, people with disabilities. And there's also some organizations. There was an organization I worked at with at RSF um, that was really focused on developmental disabilities and housing, but I do think disabled, disabled people, and I know that's not the right term to use right now, and I'm trying to think in my head, you know, like, I think I'm going to use people with Asperger's as, or autism as an example, so, you know, there's neurotypical people and uh, neuroatypical people, and I think it's, like, they're often invisible lives, like, the, the COVID pandemic has just shown, like, how a lot of what we're doing, like working from home and having access to all of all of what we can to keep us safe because we're able-bodied and we needed it, but folk who were not able-bodied who had been crying out for this, you know, were unable to get it. So I think a lot of it just comes down to like listening to people and finding the specific organizations that are funding. So there, as I said, there's a couple of CDFIs. I know that there are some foundations that focus specifically on disabled people. I'll be candid, it's not. The demographics that we've been looking to serve with Olamina have been black, indigenous, people of color, and we haven't specifically gone for that demographic, just like we haven't specifically gone to, for veterans. But I think it's also just about how do we give people the platform so that their voice is heard. Thanks, thanks, Lynn. And I, I just want to pick up on this. I think, um, you know, there's been quite a, a lively sort of sort of a back and forth in the chat about kind of setting up this almost parallel system that even as you've described it, then kind of often will focus on specific places and communities, specific groups of people with specific characteristics and so on. And, and in some ways, I think that very bottom up way of very locally engaging with individuals, having their empathy, building new forms of financing, trying out new things, kind of experimenting is the word language that we would often use when we talk about innovation in these areas. It's incredibly, incredibly important. And I think you raise, Amelia, you do too, this important question as to whether or not that sort of, you could imagine a, a kind of a parallel economy that has this rich set of experiments that are trying new things and doing new things. Um, and, and I do think the issue is whether or not that then ultimately will influence the sort of mainstream systems and structures and institutions that we have. I, I think that there's probably pros and cons because on the one hand, if you keep it where it is, it kind of re retains its authenticity and empathy and that connection. But on the other hand, if it doesn't sort of shift over and affect the, the sort of the, the dominant system, we risk losing something and losing scale. And we risk the fact that we have to do things over and over and over and over again. And so I hope that there are moments and real opportunities that we can actually bring over some of those experiments and say you know as somebody said here it doesn't have to be about better financial returns and and, Tom and outcomes you can demonstrate extraordinary returns and extraordinary outcomes especially if we define outcome in ways that that are important to us and so they're becoming an existence proof that you then bring into the mainstream mm -hmm. Malia I know you've had work doing that and many of us have and that's not easy I think that we also have to look at key influences in the mainstream and we don't need hundreds of them. I'm really struck by the fact that some of the very significant endowments or pension funds are beginning to ask questions about where their endowment is going. 
and how do they think about that and there's activism on that side on the more traditional side that I think can really open up space and if we've done the right work on this other side creating these models I hope that there's really an opportunity for that backwards and forwards so I really do think if this remains a sort of a niche activity we just won't have the impact at scale that we desperately need to have. Can I respond a little bit to that? Please do, Lynn, yes. Okay. So I think you raise an interesting, a couple of interesting points, Fiona, about one niche and two scale. So I think what we found oftentimes from my understanding of American history, if we look at like the financial system we're operating in was really set up to fund the slave trade, right? So, and it got accelerated in the 1800s, say, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, right? So really the banking system that we have that we know today is like really only 200 years old when we think about it in the context of all this time. So, you know, there is, I think that like scale can have, it seems like, oh my gosh, 200 years, like we don't want to take 200 years to change this, but it is like, it's fast in the context of time, even though it feels slow to us. So the change to, to me has to be this like, incremental, like understanding what scale looks like, how to scale serve communities. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're looking back on it, it actually moved very, very, very quickly. Um, and I think we can do that and we can have like what we're working on um, within the outside of the financial system, having it influence the financial system as well. But if I think if we're standing hoping that the financial system is gonna completely shift, mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be really, really hard to get there because I don't know because of how it's now set up, if that's possible um, in the time we would want to see. I hope it is, but it's going to take everybody who has power and influence within that system to be crying out for this change. And I think we are seeing it now with um, pension funds, corporate social responsibility. I think that's really, really important. But it also takes like, you know, we saw what happened with Parlay, for example, when their money stream got totally cut and they're gone now. We don't want that to happen to our financial system, but money really does talk. So how we are flowing capital to alternative financial institutions is really, really important to see the shift. Because if we think about community development, financial institutions, essentially what happened was the banks didn't want to take on the risk of lending to BIPOC communities. So they off balance sheet the risk to the CDFIs. Mm -hmm. And then turns out that, you know, the then government and the banks decided to be the ones that fund these. So then they created many banks <laughs> and it's like this kind of like, how do we also get out of that dynamic of if we move some of these models over to the traditional financial system and it hasn't had enough infrastructure put into place to shift, we end up recreating again what we had. And I think because of American history, there's been tons of black wealth created. And every time it's created, people just go in and rip out the infrastructure. And so part of us keeping it, you know, more niche and more in the shadows is actually so we can build that infrastructure and redundancy in place. So when a white lash comes on, there's there is enough within the system to hold it. Because this is something that has been happened throughout history. Yeah, you may, I yes. mean, you make an incredibly important point, right? Which is, so if I framed it as small experiments over here, how can we get them in the mainstream? I think what you're arguing is small experiments, let's scale them until a bit like a plant, they're kind of more robust and actually have the sort of protections, the infrastructure, the cultural norms, the institutional and legal norms around them, so that as they become, they sort of become more mainstream and they kind of grow up in parallel, as opposed to getting kind of imported and then squished. Um, and I, I think that's a very, that's an important distinction. Um, and it then ask, lets us, I think, focus on the things that make it difficult or what are the barriers that we would then need to remove to actually scale some of these kinds of things so what would we need to scale the work that Conda's doing what do we need to scale your work you know some of the work I've been involved with with um, Prime Impact Coalition which is focused on investing in uh, companies that have climate impact right how do we and with sort of diverse founders you know some of the legal infrastructure just to do these things at scale and to create the right sets of incentives and what have you just is, is complicated. So making sure we know what those points of friction are, 
which gets quite into the weeds sometimes of, of sort of law and contracts. I think those things are also really, that, that has to sit alongside the empathy is that sort of real structural understanding. And, and that's quite a bundle of things and requires really special people um, like yourself and others to do. Yes, yes. And I just want to build off of that, Fiona, and say, you know, I think I look at Clubhouse right now, which I think is one of the, you know, is is everyone loves to either love them or hate them. Um, but, you know, Clubhouse is an example of white people building wealth because of Black talent and Black talent not getting any of that ownership. And, you know, I, I think there's this underlying notion of who makes money and who doesn't. And, you know, as Nike found out back in Kylan, Colin Kaepernick was huge for their overall brand, right? I mean, they, they made billions from, from that decision. And we, I, I think that we also need to remember that this is, um, right, the, the cannabis um, industry is, is another great example of where we can come in um, and not have to play second or not have to, you know, have someone do something for us, but really, if you leave us be, we tend to grow wealth and, and we tend to be able to wholly participate in the capitalist structure. And I often think that we'll be equal when we are all making money together and, and not seen as seen as different. And Lynn, I would love to just get your thoughts, you know, as someone who being in being white, you probably have different conversations about about this issue than than people would have with me. Um, but how do we get over just what we know to be true that just ain't so, which is, you know, black and brown folks are risky and, and you know, they're laborers, they're, they're not owners. I mean, if I had the answer to that question, Malia, we would be, we would be having a very different conversation. Um, I feel like we like to default to writing white papers on these things. And like, we have to, we just have to, take some rest like people who have and I, I I don't mean risk because I actually I fundamentally don't believe investing in BIPOC communities any riskier than in investing in white communities exactly. you have to look back at the financial crisis to look at you know who what businesses closed and who lost money and like who participated in the foreclosure schemes to see that that's not necessarily the case I think that there's policies that have to happen and we have to like almost have um, a quote unquote affirmative action for like who gets priority of capital, understanding that not everybody is starting to, from the same place. Um, and I do think it is incumbent upon folk who have made their money and want to be investors. There was a question in the chat about it to like, to do the investing, you know, um, we just have to move the money. And that sounds so simplistic. And I know there's many barriers to that, but we do really have to move the money. And I wish that I had the answer to how do we get BIPOC communities not to be seen as as risky. I'm like, when they're the majority in this country, does that shift? Well, no, you only have to look at apartheid in South Africa to know that that's not going to shift things. I think it's having conversations like this. I think it's important for educational institutions to use their power and their influence in how they're talking about systemic issues. I think back to when I did my MBA and studied economics, I'm like, oh, I wish I could go back and talk about like how racism is played into the system and how inequities are and, and talk about where that's come from. It really, you know, it's, 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 in, it's small it over time. Um, if there's no big fix. If there was, we would have figured it out. Unless, I mean, the Fed said in 1950 that in order to create racial equity from a wealth standpoint in this country, you would essentially have to go back and recreate it. America, mm. from the get-go. That's in the book, The Color of Money, <laughs> just FYI. Right. And I think that's- The Fed really said, we're a day late and dollar short. That ship, that ship sailed. <laughs> that ship sailed, right? So it's like, how do you create, like, if the white- white wealth was created through the um, New Deal. Like what does the New Deal look like for um, people of color? And we knew what that looked like right before we, <laughs> during reconstruction, it was meant to be 40 acres and a mule. So like actually how do we still honor that for where we are? And I think broad, more broadly, um, like as a country and as a 
European diaspora, I would add, we need to have a truth and reconciliation process and pay reparations. Mm-hmm. And that'll start mm-hmm. to shift mindset and policy. Yeah. And that's a really yeah. scary thing for people to hear. But well, I think, I, yeah, I think we so often, we, we want to change without needing to change. Um, and anyone who's actually tried to do any personal change knows that just doesn't work, um, no matter how much you try. Um, and I, I think all of these conversations, um, Fiona, we sort of get back down to this seed, right, of who are we? Um, and what what do we um, what, what do we think is acceptable um, in in society? And you know, um, as we're um, as we're getting to close, we ask Honda about what does she see as the future of of capital and and how capital flows. Um, and and she had some interesting insights on on generational shifting. So we'll hear from Conda now. Boy, you know, I want to be hopeful. And um, what I'm seeing, one of the things that I'm seeing that's beautiful is that wealthy people, a lot of wealthy people are understanding that their wealth needs to go in places that it hasn't traditionally. And so um, they're coming in with new terms. And, um, you know, so I think that the future as I see it with, with wealth is that and I hope I'm right, is that wealth it will be distributed. It, it, it has to be distributed better than the way it is right now. You know, we always talk about the 1% and the 99% and all of that. That is unsustainable. And so the dis- redistribution of wealth has got to happen. And I think that when it comes to philanthropy, which has been um, a part of the big, a big part of the problem, the way philanthropy is, because again, it's still the plantation system, it's the plantation mentality of, you know, of um, I own this wealth and, you know, and you have to jump through these hoops to get this. And and the whole way that it's run is just been, um, yeah, it's not good for anybody really. And so I think that I see that loosening, I see that changing. And I think that those who are in the, and those who are, who have the innovative ideas, who are out there making change in the world with their businesses, that they, a lot of people are also changing in what capital that they're willing to take and that they're not willing to go down the road of the extraction. And as long, and if we stop doing that, if we stop being so desperate that we will take anything, then it's got to come differently. And I'm seeing that happening. I'm seeing funders go, oh, oh, okay, you won't. All right. Well then, you know, they've got to learn how to come in relationship. What needs the the whole transactional nature of this business has to turn into a relational nature of the business. A relational nature of the business. Um, Lynn, how how do you see the the future of of capital and and where we're where we're heading? I largely agree with Conda. Um, I do think that there are people who are thinking about how they made their money, and they're very uncomfortable with it. And what it is really incumbent upon is those people to tend to speak up and say like the work that they've done in terms of their own personal work to get to the place where they are ready to have conversations around investing in, you know, non-traditional funds that um, they haven't been unable to. I mean, there's so much education to happen just within the wealth industry with wealth advisors. Like, how are we ensuring that those people are, are able to offer alternative products and listen to their clients so their clients can influence by saying, this is what we want to see. Um, and then it's, it's, it's hard. I think there's a lot of people who are seeing racial justice as like a key tenant of what they need to do during, going forward and want to see a more equitable society. But to influence capital flowing, you actually have to influence the institution who flows the capital. And so it can't just be the external of we're gonna fund black and brown businesses. It actually has to be the internal of like, how do we support our black and brown employees? Like are our policies equitable? 
um, it has to be an, an internal and external. And that's why this work, I, as I keep saying, is like intentional and it can be incremental and it can, it's gonna take time, but it's better to build a robust system based upon examining the internal and the external than it is to like, just do a marketing campaign about like, I'm now not funding, you know, certain candidates going forward. That doesn't actually get us to where we wanna go. Okay. Well, with that, I think it um, is my role at this moment to say thank you. I want to say thank you um, live to you, Lynn, very much. Um, you've shared with us some really interesting ideas, very thought provoking, as you can see from some of the chat, uh, given us a lot to think about. And I think really helped us move this conversation forward, um, you know, from some of the conversations we had last time with banks, as well as community banks, to sort of really thinking about some of these alternatives. And then this really important dynamic tension about um, trying things in one space, scaling, uh, and making sure they have the sort of robustness that they, that they really need. Um, I definitely want to thank uh, Conda. I know that she couldn't be with us live, but you know it was wonderful to, um, you know, engage with her, her spirit, her her extraordinary sort of depth of commitment, and and you know what she brings, and some of the really important and interesting work that she's doing. Uh, Malia, you open our eyes to you know you introduce us to new people. We get to have new conversations, one that I think at MIT Sloan we've never had before, um, which is really just exciting and exactly uh, what I've always hoped for in in these discussions. So um, I do want to thank you very very much for doing that. I know that you know there are a number of these things that are really ongoing discussions, including this idea of how people who are new to their wealth. Um, you know, regardless of, of uh, race or gender, how they're beginning to think about using it differently. And some of that uh, discussion around the, the sort of the cultural economy and, and some of our sort of cultural icons um, from the African-American community, how they're thinking about bringing their wealth into this space in new ways, also an important theme I know we'll be picking up on uh, later on in this semester. Um, with that, I just want to thank everybody for being part of this discussion. And again, Malia, thank you. Uh, Lynn, thank you very much. And the whole uh, team, Patsy and others, absolutely appreciate it. And to all of you for joining us, thanks very much. <laughs>